it's go time. Welcome to the Gymnazo podcast. I've got a wonderful, inspiring, empowering guest today. Her name is Barb. Is it Blanky? You got it. Blanky. Perfect. Yes. Okay. I know. I've worked on that for years now. <laughs> uh, I met Barb about four years ago um, via my wife, who's a teacher, and had the opportunity to see Barb grow through movement and training in ways that I hadn't um, seen before in an aging population or been a part of personally. And I was immediately inspired when you had said, um, give me goals and I will, I will achieve them. Like that, you know, I'm a goal getter, so set something for me to achieve. And um, ever since that day one, it's been consistent. And that's what's inspired me in my own practice um, is the consistency that you bring literally every single day. Like well, a week ago, you'd finished a full 365 days in a row of gymnasio workouts. Even though we're closed on Sundays, you still made something happen. Um, and in one year, got 665 sessions in, which is like unheard of. Um, and it's less about how many sessions you got, but more about how consistent you were able to be um, in, in that year. And moving forward, I would love to dive deep into essentially your experience before gymnasio um, in terms of your physicality and training and intentional movement practice um, to now your experience with gymnasio and then how you see the future. So essentially my first question to you is, how did you happen to find gymnasio and uh, stick to a program? Well, I was really um, at a point in my life where I thought, oh, yoga's good to do in the evening and um, I wasn't being as active as I used to be. And I thought classes weren't all fitting in. I went to um, Cal Poly and everyone's so much younger than I am. And I thought, oh, well, you know, I can't do that. And I would compare myself and get kind of down on myself with that. And I had that fortunate um, opportunity to meet your wife and work with her and she mentioned oh and my boyfriend at the time a now yeah. husband um, <laughs> uh, uh, is a coach a personal coach I said oh I would love a personal coach I don't want a, one in the garage or anything but she said, oh, you, let me introduce you so that we got to meet at her graduation and um, that started I think it was Three weeks later, I signed up for Gymnazo, and from day one, I was just so impressed with the idea that this was about movement, not necessarily losing weight or being more fit all of a sudden, but just getting my body to be more functional and all the things that I love to do that I maybe wasn't doing as much of. What, was, what did you love to do physically before you'd walked into Gymnazo's doors? So I love to kayak. I love hiking, um, like big mountains and being outdoors. And um, I had run half marathons and convinced myself that my body was done running, that that wasn't going to really be the best thing for my joints as I aged and, um, and found out that, you know, so I just didn't do it as often. Um, I'd be really sore when I was done and think, wow, I have to really have a day to recoup and, mm -hmm. and thinking about all those things. I couldn't carry my own kayak down to the water anymore. I needed two or three people and it is a big kayak. It's not a little one, but still I used to be able to kind of get it there myself. And so I was just feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm getting older and I need more help. Was there anything telling you these thoughts? Like, was it just you going through the aging process and you were feeling differently or were there certain people in your life or, or people your age that were also talking about aging in a certain way? Um, what was your kind of perspective as you were saying, okay, I should probably stop running as much or doing it as often? Was it more of a body sensation? Was it words around you? Was it a combination of things? I think it was a combination of things. I um, definitely uh, could see people who could do it. And, um, and then my husband had some back surgery and he was told not to run anymore. And um, even he's learned since that he really can run if he works out correctly. <laughs> and so I think that medical advice kind of said, oh, well, you know, he's a few years older than I am, but not that much older. And, and I don't know, maybe running isn't my thing. I just have to find something else that um, 
that I want to do. And hiking's always been my thing. And so I've always wanted to make sure I can hike and keep up with the group and, you know, be fit for that. And I felt like I was losing some of my cardio, some of my muscle tone, just being sore, started actually experience a little bit of fear um, hmm. of, you know, I'm going to slip or fall. I don't want to break my hip. I don't want to hurt myself. Um, I always say, you know, it's kids who learn to ski and do those things because they are bones of rubber. And I n just had that feeling that, no, I, I'm older and that's not always what, what I can do. So I'm going to ask you the question that you're not supposed to ask people. How old are you, Barb? I'm 64. 64 years young, too. Like <laughs> you've, like part of the reason we wanted to bring you on to this podcast is that you've, you've shifted this messaging or status quo of what aging is, and and I think a lot of people view aging as a negative thing. Like you go down, um, and essentially deteriorate. But all I've seen you do in the past four years is grow and get stronger and more capable of movement. Um, and even enhance capacity to handle those movements that you can access. Um, and it's, that's what's really inspiring to me is that when I was initially starting to coach, I didn't want to work with what we called like geriatric or older people. And because um, the school had taught me like this is how you teach people who are over the age of 50 and over the age of 60. And I, it didn't resonate with me really well because I had... It's not what I want to do. I was a hardcore athlete working out very intensely, and I wanted to work out with people my age and, and train and coach, and that's what I was used to. Um, and as I entered gymnasio, had the opportunity to essentially completely shift that. Everybody was older than I was, and um, it gave me a mind shift and different thoughts of, like, seeing people not just on one day but from day one and then moving into their second week and third week, and then... They've completed a year, and just to see the level of movement access, like being able to get up off the ground or feel comfortable getting down on your hands and knees or swinging around a weight or jumping onto a box at the age of 50, 60, 70 years old. It was like that's not what I learned um, in school is the right thing to do, but seeing people continue to gain movement ability that they may have lost for one, two, three decades mm -hmm. and thought that they would never be able to do it again to see people light up, um, you know, in their 60s and 70s and say, like, I feel like I did when I was 40 or when I was 30. And it was just, like, so uh, so empowering to me because people tell me, like, you know what, you know, when you're my age, you'll feel this. And I totally believe it, but I see that through consistent work that that's not necessarily the same story that needs to be told. It's a different narrative. Right. Um, so where where is your mind right now currently with your training now that you've especially completed this full year? every single day. That's consistency at its finest. Um, not just even like for one hour a day, sometimes two, sometimes three. Not all performance, not all fitness, some restorative and some just exploration. Mm -hmm. um, what's what's kind of the narrative that you're carrying yourself right now to, to bring you to this state and, and to the future? Well, I think um, one of the things is that I've always, I always remember my 33rd birthday and that's the last birthday I really remember. And my mother-in-law used to always say, I feel in my brain that I'm 28, but I'm 80 something, you know, and, and I think that that's really the mindset that I have developed over the last four years of, it doesn't matter what the years are, um, set a goal and, and work towards it and do what you have to do to see if you can do that. I mean, the, I, I can't even remember what, maybe what our first goal was working together, but I remember, uh, one was you're going to run a 5k because I said, I don't think I can run anymore. <laughs> and I ran a 5k and came in third. And I was so like, cool. I mean, and, yeah. and we just, we set that goal and it changes my mindset to wanting to learn more about how my body moves and, um, and also really reflect on the fact that i never really thought about movement. I thought about muscles or our cardio, or, you know, I'd run on the treadmill, I'd pump a few weights, but I didn't really know what I was doing. And I didn't have a focus for that. And um, through all the classes and things at Gymnazo that I've learned, um, and coaches and the amounts of just immense amount of um, information and knowledge you have, uh, and all of the coaches here have, have made me really think differently about my body and how it moves and be able to talk about it too. And I think I was one of those who would go 
I would go to a workout and I'd just work really hard and then I'd go home and that's all. And um, I go home now and I think, oh gosh, I'm gonna go hiking today. I wanna do this warm up. I wanna do a little rope flow. I, I wanna look into something that keeps my body going. And um, that's just been awesome. And these four years, I, I can't tell you how many times I'll be hiking and I'll do a slight slip and I don't fall and I'll think, oh, Thank you, Gymnazo. <laughs> Thank you, because that's um, it's given me the confidence to go back and do the things that I thought I couldn't do because I was older. Wow. Yeah, that's and that's I think what's so inspiring too is that you're gaining more confidence and and doing the work on your own. And that's I think what's most inspiring to me. Like, yeah, there's elite level athletes out there doing insane things. They're putting in the work. Um, but general population, this is a fun population to work with because there's still so much magic to be shared. I mean, most of us are part of the general population. We're not playing those advanced level sports and working out for four or five hours a day and getting paid for it. You know, the inspiration has to come from within and that's the empowering piece is that we see people outside doing some wild things and I think like, okay, I could never do that. And we can get lost in like, well, I'm never gonna do that and I'm never gonna do this, never gonna do this and get stuck in that negative thought loop but finding out where that success is for you. Um, when you initially started, what did you feel that was inhibiting um, to you or, or locking you away from your full potential and movement at the age that you're, you're at? Well, I think a little bit it was time, thinking I don't have time to really change the way my body is or to the way that I function because um, I was very busy and uh, workload is pretty heavy, still still is, um, but in a different way. And um, I think just getting into that mindset, this this is how it is as you get older. You, you, you don't move as much. You don't go out and do everything you did when you were in your 20s and 30s. Um, and so a lot of that, I as a teacher, I teach growth mindset to my students and talk about growth mindset. And I really realized that I had kind of a fixed mindset about hmm. who I was and that this is just how it was going to be. Yeah. And that's in, easy to get stuck in that. It's fixed. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a path that you travel for years and years and years until something novel happens, mm -hmm. something clicks. When was it? Was it the first minute? Was it the first week? Like, when did you feel that that was changing for you from like, I know where, where I am now and where it's going to kind of take me in my years and I just have to accept it. When did something click? Well, I think actually in the first, um, when, when you did a movement analysis mm. and, um, opened my eyes to where my body couldn't move, um, where I didn't really even know, mm. I didn't really even know that I couldn't twist and turn my upper torso by itself like I thought I used to be able to. And, and, and so that started the kind of educational journey um, and then starting to go to classes and just learning about um, the different planes of motion, the way that um, I can warm up to go before a hike or before I go hiking um, that sticks with me where I'm driving a car and think, gosh, I'm just tired. I get up, get out of the car and, and do a couple warm up moves and, and get back in and, and function in a different way. So I really think it started with day one, but um, starting with classes, um, I always, I was kind of not a class person, I was, other than yoga, um, which you have your eyes closed for most of the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I would, cause I compare myself to other people and um, which may, then puts a unrealistic competitiveness sometimes for me. And um, so I found that classes here were just so absolutely fun, first of all, and amazing. And I learned something in every single one. And being that lifelong learner kind of quest person, I think that that really made a difference for me in wanting to come to class every day of, I'm going to learn something new about me, uh, just about life in general. Um, and it's going to better prepare me to do what I want to do. Oh, that's so cool. Um, something else you, you do so well that I think contributes to this this new journey is that you take advantage of our of our gymnasio ecosystem as we call it. You know, we think of a lot of things in threes and like a triadox. It's not just about fitness. It's not just about performance. There's also restorative elements to it. I um, mean, there's so many more dimensions as well. But 
um, you really take advantage of not just working out and working out hard, but sometimes you do multiple sessions a day. And tell me about your experience with the gymnasium ecosystem. You know, we have the restorative programs specific for group and fitness and performance, and then there's more one-on-ones and semi-private for more um, intentional programming based on your success and where you want to be. Do you mind talking about your experience with the ecosystem and how you see your schedule fit each week because you are so consistent with it? Sure. Um, I think that's part of the reason I can be so consistent is that um, I will schedule a workout but then get a, a melt mold move of just rolling and stretching, some mobility stick work, um, things that help release some of the tension from a hard workout, um, help my body move in different ways so my workouts are more efficient as well. Um, super, that was super important at the beginning of uh, those two classes really made a difference. And then I did start with semi-privates too. And having that coach with four people and having a plan, that's where I really think I started setting my goals and um, with the help of you <laughs> and um, saying, gosh, you know, I'd really like to do this. Um, the other part of the ecosystem too is that you do quarterly fitness consults with us so we can set goals and think about what do we want to do next what is the next place so I'm not just coming doing the same old thing and having a social group to chit chat with I actually think okay this is going to really help me towards that goal and um and it's really made a huge difference. And then this past year's goal, <laughs> which is almost a year, almost over a year, um, I've never been able to do a push-up. I don't tell everyone in the world that, yeah. but um, I've never been able to do a push-up. And, and I said, I just like to have strong shoulders and um, be able to do a push-up. And so you and I have been working um, in my semi-privates with that. And then I've been trying to every four to six weeks have an exclusive because um, that's that soft tissue and movement combination. And I used to go have a massage once or twice a month um, because my muscles would be sore and that kind of thing. And I've learned that that combination of of um, you know some table work and, and soft tissue and then getting up and moving it in the right way has really opened my shoulders up to a point where I may be able to do a push-up some days very yes. soon. So um, and and that's that's super exciting. I I could say at my age, but I don't ever think about it that way. I just think it's exciting because I've never been able to do it. It's a new <laughs> learning. It's a new piece of movement for me. Yeah, it's, an, it's so powerful to be able to speak that into existence, too, and that's something you've done from day one that I've met you, is I have to say it out loud, I'm going to write it down, and then you go get it, and you do the work outside of, outside of the facility, you know, and in real life, and it's on, on the front of your mind, um, and you breathe into that experience versus having it set you back. You know, it's a, it's a tough enough challenge where you're like, I literally cannot do this thing. Mm -hmm. And there's things that I can do to step towards that, that it's going to take time. And there's really so much trust in the process that I think so many people want that quick progression. They mm -hmm. want to feel that heavier load and, um, you know, just keep pushing the weights. And especially as we're getting into older age, we start to realize that, ooh, what I've been doing to my body may actually be harming it. Now, at what point, you know, at what age do you then say, I'm done pushing heavier weights? And I think there should be a, never a time for that. It's just, what can I do for this? And um, we've had conversations about other ways to progress. And it's through movement skills, and it is through capacity training, but it's really about the availability of movement. So we've worked on, like, getting up and down from the ground, mm -hmm. like being in a seated position. So much so, like, this is what really got me so stoked was... Um, we built our outdoor arena. We have a garden area out there, and we'd been working on your deep end range squats, like just sitting comfortably with your hands touching the ground, knees bent, and like heels off the ground. And I was coaching a session, and you'd been doing some pulling some weeds in a deep squat, working your range of motion, and something we'd be progressing in a session. And now you're doing it post session, not only pulling your weeds, but also working on progressing your squat. Um, and then you're like, check it out. My heels can touch the ground. And it was like three or four weeks, not even that long later. And mm -hmm. just those, those big wins that happen in little times that feed those things that do take a longer time, like building some foundational core strength and deeper shoulder strength to be able to do a push-up. Mm -hmm. um, I encourage everybody to speak things into existence and to 
recognize those limitations and not be turned away by them, but to be pushed towards that goal. Um, for your push-up game right now, where's your mind at? And I want you to be transparent and honest mm-hmm. because we've been working on it for a few months mm-hmm. and it's, we've been working on shoulder strengthening and pulling and pushing motions and we're starting to progress now into like ground and box uh, push-ups more from off the knees and getting into that full range push-up where you, you feel very satisfied with it. Not just like, ah, I got it done to get it done, but I feel like I know that push-up. Where are you at right now with that experience? Um, I feel... I feel like super close. Um, I think it's learning how to get the different parts of my body to move at the right time together. And I never really thought about that before. I thought about, oh, I just don't have upper body strength. I know in my, in our initial meeting and movement analysis, I said I, I have no upper body strength. And so I know I have upper body strength. Um, In fact, I was out kayaking with one of my friends, um, Barbie, um, the last time she was here in October. And and she goes, oh, I tried to take a picture. I can see definition as you're you're rowing in your shoulders. And she's always been a good cheerleader for me. And I just thought, wow, really? And and so I think that um, I trust that my body can do it and I just have to be patient with getting it to move all at the same time and to build the strength in, in that core and get get that put together um, with the shoulder strength that I'm building and that you've helped me build. And that's been absolutely amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, and even if, well, I should not say that because you know I'm, you know that won't happen, but even if I don't ever do a push-up, oh, come I on. so much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got me to do box jumps. I was so fearful of box jumps. I remember. And I'm still, still takes me a little bit of gut to jump my whole body off the ground and, and do them and, um, you know, uh, but I did it, and I just really, really appreciate that press for my mindset, especially too, because I think um, it's kind of that fear that gets in the way sometimes of people saying that they can work out. Oh, I, I don't feel really good right now, and and I love it because I can say the shoulder is just not doing the right thing today, and you'll say, well, let's do this and let's get this going, and I'll walk away an hour later thinking, holy cow, I I, need, I wish I had that knowledge, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I I love that, um, and that's a really important part. I think another part, too, that I, I didn't mention is that um, I u- until a year ago with the pandemic, I traveled for my living. and I was 200 on, days out of the year. Yeah, at least. More, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on airplanes and hotel beds and that kind of thing. And that was another part of Gymnazo's ecosystem was that when I did meet with you, um, you would – what the workouts we were doing in a semi-private, you would videotape and I would take them with me. And so I would work out on the road and I would make sure that that was happening. Um, and I fit it into the day, no matter what time zone I was on or whatever, um, I could do a restorative or I could do a real hard workout. And I, two pieces of equipment and could do it in a hotel room. What'd you, if what'd you bring? A gym. <laughs> I usually, well, I started with a roller and it took so much um, space in the ball, in the suitcase. So right. <laughs> um, I took a ball, so a ball and sometimes a kneeling pad because sometimes I would be, I don't, I don't like to lay down in carpets of <laughs> hotels. Oh, and airports too, right? <laughs> and airports, yeah. yeah, exactly. So those two things um, were huge. Um, when I go back on the road, or if I do, um, I have more equipment now that I would probably take with me. Um, and thinking about um, just even, I, 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 well, oh, I had the two balls with the spring in the middle of them. Yeah, that the dog I, bone, and I, yeah, the dog Thank bone. you, trigger point. Right, right. I would carry those on, and every single time I'd get stopped at security, like, what is this thing <laughs> in her suitcase? And finally, the airport, at least here, would say, oh, yeah, it's okay. Let her go. It's just she an exercise thing. Doing. So, um, But that was great on airplanes, just to have that to sit and roll on and sit on top of and, and be able to work through and doing. But I didn't need a lot of equipment. I I would probably find a broomstick or something now because the mobility stick is amazing and what it can do and thinking about it. But yeah, so those those were the things that I took and I could do my workouts because you 
you know, program them in a way that you knew I would have a chair, you know, or whatever, but I wouldn't have a whole lot of things. And um, it still keeps you moving. And it's all about that because the weeks that I wouldn't work out, and there were weeks sometimes mm -hmm. um, when I was running to airports and getting in at midnight and just had no energy. And I would, um, I, I can tell a difference. I can just tell a difference in how I feel, how, my energy level, what I want to do that day. Um, and I want to feel like that. I don't want to feel like, oh, I just want to sit down in the chair and do nothing. So it, You reminded me of something you had shared with me a couple years back that we had started doing some more running motions and working on foot strength and stability. And you'd said, I, I didn't miss my flight. I had ran from one terminal to another and I got there and I was so stoked. Like that's a huge win to celebrate. And I, I respect and admire your ability to just bring that up because most people may just hold that in like, yeah, I just ran from one to another. But feeling like I want to share that, you know, that, that, that's exciting. It's, mm -hmm. I can trust my body to get me from A to B and get there quickly and not have to worry, you know. Right. Um, but kind of switching this now down to, to COVID since COVID, you haven't had to travel 200 plus days out of the year. Not at I've all. seen your home gym grow tremendously. Like you have equipment that every single person should have in their house. Honestly, um, you get your whole little space and like the mats and everything. Tell me like what, what you use at your house. Cause I know you're doing work on your own. There's no way you could be progressing the way you are by not doing other work than just taking classes. It's definitely your personal practice and what you decide to do that's contributing to your, your overall success. Yeah. Yeah. I have a mini gymnasio gym at home, <laughs> which is great. I now have a new item too. I want a mace. Yes. Oh, <laughs> so, I love that. Um, but uh, that will be maybe July. Um, we'll <laughs> see. Um, oh gosh. Probably the thing that I use most routine, and um, then I'll list it all, but is my RMT my RMT rope. Rotational movement training rope. Oh my goodness. I, I just, I can barely get up in the morning and not feel like I should just swing it a little bit and get my shoulders open and, you know, feel like I wasn't laying in bed all night, which I did, which is good. Sleep is good. Um, mm -hmm. but I have two Vipers. I have, um, three different weighted sand bells. Um, I have some old, um, just um, dumbbells that I used to have, and I still use them occasionally, um, especially on a lighter day. Like this morning at 6 a.m. after seeing you for semi-private at 5.30, I we was worked. a little bit Yesterday. lighter. <laughs> um, so I have some choices with that. Um, a roller, the ball, um, and let's see, um, I have an ab dolly. I love, the one thing I missed the most when Gymnasio, kind of, you know, we had to do virtual was mm -hmm. the ab dolly. It was honestly <laughs> the first thing I ordered because I actually like it. Um, uh, um, so uh, let's see, gosh, oh, I have a BOSU ball. That's, and I'm finally learning to stand upside, with it upside down <laughs> on the flat side. side. Yeah, it's deceivingly which, difficult. Oh, well, well it's, there's a fear thing again, too. Of, that's that get on and are you going to fall, um, which I don't have that fear nearly as much as I used to. And, um, gosh, I'm sure there's something. Oh, I have a, I have a sledgehammer. <laughs> That's only, a, it's never been used in the yard. <laughs> Those were like the old days of COVID. It was, it was like, grab your, right. grab your yard tools. Right. And yeah. Let's make yeah. some fun. Yeah. And, and then I have, um, two, well, three different sizes of mobility sticks. That's um, so rad. So, yeah. What do you find yourself? It, I'm going to go two parts of this. Uh, what do you find yourself using most, most often currently? I mean, I know it probably switches based on what we're doing in our one-on-one -on -one sessions and mm -hmm. exploring what we're doing. Um, so you love the RMT rope. So for, let's start with that. What do you what do you love using and primarily stick with when you're doing our, our virtual workouts at home? Um, I or even exploring. Yeah, I think um, the RMT rope obviously is a almost a daily thing for me. Um, uh, at least five minutes, if not longer, um, just to open up the shoulders and all of that. And then um, I I roll pretty much every day. Um, I try to do that right after dinner, just as kind of like, okay, dinner's done, day's done, um, just to keep myself open. Um, the mobility stick has absolutely changed my life from working at home because everything I did on the road, I do behind the computer on mm -hmm. Zoom now. And um, sometimes for six, seven hours a day, I'm 
teaching teachers um, on Zoom, and um, I can get up during a break and grab that stick. And what's really cool is that my library office that I Zoom in is also my workout room, so everything's right there. And Hi, so, baby. yeah, <laughs> so um, so the mobility stick for just a good stretch. Um, looking at that, um, and then well, I couldn't do virtual workouts at home without um, a, a good Viper. I, I, I bought a offshoot one first and it, it's okay. <laughs> but yeah, investing in, in the good one was, was really great. And the only limitation is that I don't have tall ceilings. So um, I have to be careful. I've only whacked the light Nothing's once or broken twice. Yet, Nothing's right? broken yet. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so all of those things come in and sand bells I use every day um, in our workouts together. And um, I don't as much on my own. So I think those are the biggies. The Bosu, oh, the Bosu ball I use in between seeing you all the time. I was say you're probably on that thing often, yeah. Well, it's just, <laughs> it, if I'm working on my core and I'm working on balance and, you know, being able to stretch and slip and not fall and all of that, that that's an amazing tool. Yeah, really about utilizing both sides. And I want to tap into why that's important, especially for you in a moment. Um, but also, how do you choose, like you had mentioned, hey, we had a, tough session yesterday night, you're going to work out in the morning. Most people would say, I'm just too sore to go work out. But we know there's a different way to perceive working out and it could be more restorative of a workout in the same session somebody's working out for more performance or more just fitness to, to get their heart rate up or, mm -hmm. um, you know, get a sweat going. How do you decide what, what weight to use or, you know, we give you a lot of options in our workout and you've got a whole, whole uh, library of equipment, you know, so, so how do you just determine what you're going to use. Is there questions is, that you ask yourself, you ask the coaches? Because I'm not the only one that coaches you. Right. right? So, so right. where do you go? Um, the coaches are great because they always say, you know, to, to let them know, even if we're virtual, but in person or virtual, you know, in the chat box if there's anything. And, and I don't even chat box it. I usually just say, you know, I'm my core is super, super sore from last night. And um, I just, is there a modification for this? Um, uh, for me, I think it's, I learned to really tune into my own body in the last four years in a way different way than I ever have before. Mm -hmm. um, even, even in what I eat, um, you know, get up in the morning and I'll say, oh, oatmeal's already made. It's in the fridge. You can just, oh, I don't feel like that today. My body's saying it really wants some avocado and egg or, you know, something. So I, I'm learning to, um, just think, where am I at? Um, like this morning, I got up an hour before workout, and I ate, and, and I thought, okay, I can push myself, but I want to be really careful about how sore I was um, from last night's workout. And I wasn't super sore. I, I just had one part of my body that I thought, mm, if we're, if we're going to work that today, I'm going to use a little bit lighter weight on it. And then usually Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm pushing, I want the heaviest weight I can and stuff. And then by the end of the week, <laughs> I s sometimes will say, I, I don't, I want to be able to laugh and, and reach <laughs> and pick something up. So, right. <laughs> yeah. I think it's wonderful to, to, that's what keeps you consistent is to be able to have that conversation with yourself. And I've seen your ability to communicate what's going on with your body and what you sense, um, with other coaches and with myself so much more effectively. Um, and it takes time. It's not like oh, it happens overnight because you've got to learn what your body feels like. And many people don't trust their feeling. Um, and it makes sense because we don't know what our bodies, they're not using, it's not using words. It's using sensation and, you know, we might feel something in our shoulder, in our neck, or even in our head. And our initial reaction, I think, if we don't have that three-dimensional knowledge is that it's that issue with that part of our body. You know, our head is our head, our shoulders is our shoulder, our low back is our low back. And to be able to, to communicate, this is what's hurting on me, and then to hear feedback going, let's assess how your hips are moving or how your core is moving. And is there a dysfunction going on that we need to address and resymmetricize or address an asymmetry um, and fix something that's kind of a little off balance? Or is it more so that there is soreness and your body may have just been working harder on one side than another? Mm -hmm. um, and something that I want to bring up, which is so cool too, that people need to know about you. You've been playing violin for 50 years, yes. 50, what, 54 now? Uh, what, I don't know, a long Who time. Who knows? <laughs> um, and so you hold your violin on your left side mm -hmm. and so your arm is 
bent and you're in a certain position, your right arm is moving a lot, but your left arm's got to be stable. And that immediately creates an asymmetry in terms of your body positioning. And it's a position of value because you're playing music and you're part of a, of a, a symphony and, 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 and if I'm saying that right, symphony mm-hmm. and orchestra, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And you play for hours at a time or um, yep. practice for hours at a time, mm-hmm. especially and um, throughout the week, like it puts your body in that position. Your body thinks I got to go back to that position subconsciously. Mm-hmm. So, so that Bozu is so effective is that it forces you to realize when you're putting too much weight on a side or you're, you're asymmetric because you'll keep tilting or falling or feeling one side working too hard. Um, tell me a little bit about, about your experience with violin and, and, um, you know, what got you into that? I think it's an inspiring art that many people have and we don't realize that that can put us into positions, especially mm-hmm. guitar players or instrument players. You play it on one side. Mm-hmm. Um, how has that influenced uh, your training and, and how you look at it now? It's kind of an open-ended question, but I want you to talk about your violin playing, okay. really. <laughs> well, I, I started when I was nine because I could, um, and my brother had played, so there was a violin in the house. Um, we have four kids, and so that was it. And band didn't start for another year. I think I really wanted to play the flute. But I started with the violin, and I really, really liked it. And um, I thought it was a cool instrument, and I liked classes. I liked I'm not a solo violinist by any means. I love playing with a group of people. Um, Once again, you learn when you play with other people than when you just play by yourself um, in a different different level in some Mm -hmm. ways. Um, So, yeah, I I just it became a real big part of my middle school and high school um, uh, career. I got to go on a concert tour. my freshman year in college to Taiwan with a group and it was like oh this is like what it is to be a roadie you know in a band or whatever (laughs) you get to go and play you get to see places um so I actually have a degree in music um but um and I wanted to be a musical therapist and so I think that that kind of puts my whole love of things together. I took anatomy and physiology because I wanted to be a therapist. I wanted to go into how can music be part of therapy and it's still something that completely enthralls me. Um, I'm totally into singing bowls. (laughs) Uh, Yes, I mean, uh, just it's amazing. I don't know how to play them at all, but just listening to them changes my whole state of being, um, playing um, music. But I, I've had several things. I had uh, nerve damage in one of my fingers that they said it was probably from playing the violin, you know. And mm-hmm. the doctor said, "Oh, we could write that in the journal, up in a journal." It's so interesting, you know. Um, I've been told I have um, some arthritis in my shoulder and neck, most likely from playing the violin mm-hmm. um, and being in that strange position for so many years and looking at that. But now, when I go to a rehearsal, one I have. Uh, a better seat. I take care of how I'm seated. I care about whether my chair is too high or too low and how that influences how I'm holding my violin. And, um, and then I get up at breaks and I stretch and I do our warm up and I do the gymnasio warm up and people are looking at me and I don't care <laughs> um, because then the next hour and a half is pleasant and I can hmm. still move and, and work. But it still is, it's, it's a very unnatural um, position. And I've learned also to um, lessen my tension when whole, you're not supposed to get tight. The whole mm-hmm. idea, they put a chin rest there, but you're not really supposed to <laughs> grip down on there. And um, uh, so I've learned it's helped my playing, actually, um, in being able to relax and um, have better movement. It's so cool because I, w- I work with quite a few musicians that work out here that you wouldn't know, but you start to address these asymmetries in a movement assessment just to, just to get a feel for how somebody's moving. And these stories come out about, you know, I've been playing for years and especially playing for decades at a time and, and being consistent with that. Nothing wrong with the positions we get into. We just realize, we, we tend to not realize what it's doing to our body. And then over the years now, we develop some kind of arthritis or discomfort or pain that is associated with aging. When I think it's sure it has to do with the years and you're getting older, but more so it's how much time you've spent cumulatively in those positions that we can start to change this conversation around, oh, I have shoulder pain because I'm getting to this age. And we can take more power over that and say, 
I've, you know, I've been in a position for a lot of my life that holds me here for hours at a time. Mm -hmm. And there are things I can do to counteract that or to re-symmetry, symmetricize our body to where now it takes up less mental real estate of the pain that we're in, the discomfort that we're in. And we tend to see those who don't do much movement um, and stretching and mobilizing, but staying in a position, it may not even be music, it might be you're working, you're a contractor and you always hold something up on your shoulder or you're always swinging with one arm or you're an elite level athlete and throwing with your right hand. Like there's all these things that we do consistently that pull us into a position. And when we realize there are things we can do to negate that or to counteract it, especially if you're sitting at a desk for hours at a time mm -hmm. over and over like that, your body will value that position and want to be seated when you're standing and then you get back pain. And it's tough to tie those together and connect the dots of, well, this pain started a little bit, didn't do anything about it. Now it's been 10 years and now it's chronic. Mm -hmm. And that happens, especially with musicians, especially with desk sitters. And there's nothing wrong with those positions, you know, and we started to, talk about just here's how to do the opposite spend time in the opposite position and now you can value your standing position and now you feel comfortable running not because um, you're just trying to strength train but because you balanced out the sides that were causing that discomfort it's just it's inspiring to, to see somebody go through that process and, and come out of it going I feel like I've learned something I feel better and I've cleared up some space in my mind that now there's more room for gratitude and joy and peace and all this um, enjoyment in life rather right. than festering over the pain and identifying with that discomfort. So mm -hmm. anybody listening, just whatever position you're in right now, do, try to do the exact opposite. Think right. about it, right? We need a standing position. Nothing wrong with seated, nothing wrong with rolling, rolling forward. Just need to think about the mm -hmm. opposite. Balance ourselves out. Yeah. Something else you do I, in... You've posted on social media, but more so, it's just you bring this energy to gymnasiums. Like you celebrate your movement. Like you said, I don't care what I look like when I'm doing these stretches because you've now embodied this. And it's once you've embodied a p position or a motion or an intention, it doesn't matter what other people say to you because now you know why you're doing it, and you can share with them that hopefully that it will resonate. Um, how do you find time in your day to, to celebrate movement or just to to be mindful of your movement? Um, I think. Uh... I, I actually schedule um, my workouts, um, and if someone calls and says, can you do it? No, oh, I'm booked at 6 a.m., or I'm booked, and I, I sometimes work at 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. because I'm working internationally, so I have weird hours, and there's certain things that um, just... It's, it's like a doctor's appointment or a haircut to me. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I'm, I booked it and I, I want, I want to be there and I want to be able to do that. Um, when I get really excited when I have the opportunity to be out, um, in nature or, um, the beach or somewhere and I do something new and yeah, I, I'll take a selfie and say, yes, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, did, couldn't do this a year ago. I couldn't do this three years ago. I maybe never did this in my life. Um, I'm starting to get experiences at my age in my 60s of, wow, I've never done this. Why have I never done this before? And um, so that gets me excited. And also, I, I really feel like everyone should get the experience that I've had for the last four years of understanding more about how my body works, how my brain works, how, you know, how it all functions together and um, creates really who I want to be. And, you know, in, in the last year or so, I just keep saying, you know, people say, what's your word, what's your intention, you know, and I said, I just want to be more joyful because when when you hurt or you're cranky or you're overworked or you're stressed, um, you just lose the joy of the day-to-day -day life. And um, I think I just heard a quote um, last week. I, don't, I won't quote it exactly right because I'm not good at that. But it, it, it's like if you live in the past, you live in fear. And if you live in the future, you live with anxiety. And so that present moment is where I'm really focusing on being more present, being more present in my workouts that – I chose to take this hour and be here for myself, and I want to do everything I can do to the best of my ability during that time. And then just time to be out with dogs and my family and, you know, and nature. Yeah, the present is truly a gift, and, yes. and you live that 
Uh, one of my or my motto of this year was, and uh, you've heard it, is embody Meliora, which is like the pursuit or the the path to to better. And not necessarily that there's always like the grass is greener on the other side, but just keep watering your grass and making it greener and making it better. And you're like more embodying your entire experience. And um, you've done that through movement. You've done that through training. You've done that through celebrating your success. Something we haven't touched on is nutrition. And I think that's something you've done uh, more intentionally recently. Do you mind talking about uh, stepping into nutritional programming and, and working with your diet and incorporating that into your training? Sure. Um, I don't think I, I've always struggled with weight a little bit for my entire life. And, um, whether I was working out, whether I was swimming and, um, just kind of thought, oh, this is my body type. This is who I am. You know, I'm not my sister who's tall and thin and size two and, (laughs) um, and all of those great things. And I would compare myself and think about that. And I've always worked at eating really healthy. And actually two years ago, um, I did the nutrition, um, with Michael, um, which was online and, and kind of fine tuned eating well and, uh, thinking about what I was eating. Um, but didn't change my, um, uh, didn't, didn't lose that weight. And, and I would always say, well, I lost some, I, I have to say, I'm, since I started gymnastics, I've lost 30 pounds. Congratulations. I know. That's, I know. That's and cool. 10 of it was before this year. And, um, and that felt really good. And that gave me a lot more energy. And I felt like I was really focused on what I was eating. But then, um, this past year I started working with Sara, who's an amazing nutritional consultant and just brilliant woman. And we really looked at, um, the emotional side of eating as well as what I was eating. Cause when I would keep a food log, she said, well, you're eating the right things, but we did simple, simple little things. Whereas I would skip lunch cause I'm working. I'd sit at the computer and realize it's five o'clock and not mm-hmm. have eaten anything all day other than the water or maybe a handful of nuts that was, you know, by. And um, even when I used to travel on the road, I, I stood up and did seminars for six hours every day. And at lunchtime, I would check my email and I wouldn't really eat. And then I'd be really hungry for dinner and I'd eat big dinners. And, and so her background of just, uh, I haven't counted a calorie for the last eight months. I haven't thought about, um, should I have that? I think, or can I have that? Or can't I have that? I thinking completely about, do I want that? And, um, it, there's no, no limiting, um, in this, but she really helped me understand that my, what my metabolism was and, and what my body needs and my personality needs. And, um, I'd never considered what I ate in all those realms in those three realms. And, um, so once again, it became a goal, um, you know, of, well, I'm going to, uh, really learn about this over these, it started as eight weeks. And, uh, I really want to, see if I can change my mindset. And a lot of it is about mindset training that she does and thinking about it. And um, I always have a big lunch now and I have smaller dinners and it makes a huge difference for my body and my personality type of having energy all day and and staying really focused and getting, I get so much more done. And uh, so that, that has been huge for me, um, just thinking about, um, meditating every day, keeping a gratitude journal every day. I would start them and never keep it, you know, and do it. And that has really changed my focus of, I have so many things to be grateful for. Well, I got another two hours in me. (laughs) I can do something else. So that's been huge. It's amazing how um, nutrition is as much behavioral as it is biological, as it is physical. You know, what you see and what what you sense and what you feel within yourself um, and then what you think about it too. And you, it's interesting that you didn't talk much about food. You talked more about the mental side of it, emotional side of it, which a lot of it is, you know, food is a very comfortable thing for, for many people, especially as we age, we are, we're just continuing to refine that feedback loop of food makes me feel happy. And many times we're disconnected with that and we eat food that makes us unhappy. 
but for the time being, it makes us happy and satisfies a, an urge that's not necessarily hunger, but it's more of something mental that's being unaddressed or um, it's tough to find. Like sometimes it's just deep in the shadows of trying to figure out why I'm I craving this thing when I don't even really want it. And mm-hmm. then you look at it, I'm so happy I had that. And you're like, I'm so mad I ate that, you know? And, and I also think that um, someone like me at my age, um, I, I've done every diet out there I've done the, you know, and you lose and you come back and I, and, and I love her philosophy of this is an anti-diet program, (laughs) um, that we work for. And, um, and there's no drugs you're taking or anything like that. It's a, it's, it's a whole person approach, um, to what you eat and how you eat it and what it's right for your body. And I never, ever had that mindset before of thinking about, what's right for me and what do I want? And, and once again, it was also getting to that point of, um, I never say I can't have that. I can have anything I want. Yes. I just can't have it every day. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and, or I, and I don't want it every day. I have, I, other than trying to support local restaurants, I don't eat out uh, because I'd rather cook and I do love to cook and I always have, but I, be tired and throw together whatever was quick and easy instead of what was healthy. So a little bit of planning in there. Yeah. That's why we love Sarah and her, and her program and and really any nutritionist and somebody who's looking at it from a 3d perspective, you know, it is behavioral, it is biological, it is physical. And that's what we do with movement training is you got to find what's right for you. Like we can't just put you into a box and say, here's your progressive overload and build strength. You will build strength being consistent, but you may never find that connection that then brings you to another level and evolves you through your life. Mm-hmm. You know, same thing with nutrition. You, you lose weight, and then you gain it back. You lose it, you gain it back. Or you lose it, and you just don't feel like you can be consistent with your practice. And really, I think what it comes down to is not about losing weight, and it's not about getting stronger. It's about building a, a more holistic connection with our body and with our environment and with our uh, community. And I think aging is the same kind of thing. It's, it is a mental process. It is a biological process, and it's a physical process process and how we see our environment and us in it. Um, So before we close out, I I want to know if you have any advice for those who are going through this aging process. We all are. I I don't know anybody who's not aging. (laughs) The alternative isn't good. (laughs) Yeah. So you're alive, you are living well, um, and there's always ways to make change and transformation. So for those that are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, you're you're in the 60s right now and experiencing this decade, and it's a decade of growth. What would you say to those who are going through this aging process and may be struggling to find a connection with themselves that is more in the growth setting? Mm-hmm. I think don't let fear get in the way of what's reality would be one of my big things is because I think that was part of it. And also don't compare yourself to someone else. Only, only work towards what you want and set goals that you can. And I've even learned, I mean, as a teacher, I know about setting goals for learning and that kind of thing. And I've used those kinds of goals where it's got to be measurable. It's got to be attainable. It's, it can't be, you know, I can't say, oh, you know, I want to, go do something I know that I can't attain. But to set those simple goals and take that first step, and I always call it dipping your big toe in the water. Um, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of um, other people being critical, especially at Gymnazo. Uh, You know, I can't tell you how many times I'll shake my head and think I can't believe I just put my right foot in front of my, and I'm supposed to put my left foot there. And, (laughs) And every single coach will say, that's why we're here and don't worry about it. It's that's, that's not the issue. You know, we just want to make sure you're getting the best movement out of this. So use your other foot or Hmm. use your other arm. And, um, and I think the coaching style here too is so easy to, um, become a part of, um, the gymnasio family or ecosystem because, um, everyone's, everyone's got your back always. They're always trying to help you be better and press you just a little bit in the direction you're choosing. So my biggest advice is, you know, don't let your age tell you you can't get to the top of that mountain or do three of them in one day. Um, (laughs) And um, just choose your goals and start working at it a little at a time and find the 
right place where the coaches are as knowledgeable as you all are and really press you into where you want to be pressed um, and, uh, and support you and give you, you know, last night you even said, you know, just take it a little easy tomorrow, <laughs> you know, and you don't say that very often. Yeah. And, and so um, take it to heart. And also don't be afraid. I think at the very beginning, too, I'm one of those who I, I revere coaches, conductors, people who have knowledge that I don't have. And, and I'll be quiet and I'll just say, OK, I'll do what they say and, and, and I'll get better. And it really was the invitation um, from everyone here of tell us how you're feeling. Don't be afraid. You know, if something's bothering you, say it out loud. Um, we can only help make it better. And if you know that when you take that risk of saying, gosh, my ankle really hurts today, that you're going to make it better, it's not going to get worse. Whereas if I kept it to myself, um, I would just try to make it better myself. Mm. So um, trusting experts you know, and, and finding that, that right coach relationship. Thanks for sharing that. You know, we, we've learned so much from you, like we, as much as we're the teacher and you're the student, like we're also the student learning from you and especially being younger. Um, I want to give some advice to some coaches cause I never saw myself doing this a, a decade ago. Um, maybe even seven, eight years ago, I was working with younger, younger, um, people and there's so much power we have as coaches that it's, it's easy to get lost in telling people what to do and following a protocol of what we've been taught. And there's so much more to it than that. And it's understanding where your client, where your athlete, where the person in front of you currently is in terms of their availability to move and also what their goals are. Like many people come in not having a specific goal. They just want to look good, feel good, and be stronger, which is fantastic. But where do we start with that? And we got to start with success. We also have to understand where those limitations are. So some kind of movement assessment that really looks at full 3D access, you know, in front of you, behind you, to the sides of you rotationally, because as we age, we tend to, we tend to currently avoid what's behind us and rotationally, and we tend to focus on so much more what's in front of us, and we become more tunnel vision, but we know there's so much more, and the more you can expose your athletes, your clients to novel experiences, but then also build consistency in those new experiences until it builds a whole new comfort level. You're gonna find that it may be slow success, but by the time you get to that goal or that threshold or that mission that was for that month or that year, getting out of pain or maybe doing a 5K or doing a three peak hike in one day that you never thought of doing, like those are the wins and the successes that keep us in it. And not only fulfills us as, as coaches and trainers, but as human beings uh, in building that connection and seeing each other help, you know, help each other. We get smarter, you get smarter, you get stronger, we get stronger. And it really is that, that collaboration. It's not you telling the athlete what to do. It may be that for part of it and for a lot of it, but it's also about the communication and, and the transparency between coach to athlete. Coaches, we don't know everything. We really don't know everything. And the more we know it, the, we tend to understand that we know so little. Um, but there's so much that we can do with what we know. We just need to be open to understanding on a deeper level. And it does come down to behavioral, biological, and physical sciences uh, or the applied functional sciences to, to find that three-dimensional success um, worth where we're at. So, mm -hmm. Barb, thank you so much. Any last uh, comments or things that come up? Oh, I think it's great. I learned <laughs> a lot. You. Yeah, Thanks. I learned a lot, too. It was a, a, a blessing and honor to, to sit down with you and chat with you and um, – Thank have you. this opportunity. So Thank hope you. you guys all enjoyed this conversation and uh, looking forward to how you all uh, perceive your aging now after listening to this. Enjoy. <laughs>